I'm good to go, Tim. Street in Tulsa, which is Route 66. 
Here's another scene in the museum that's been there. Uh, I've changed it around several times. Uh, this is a 64 Parisian Safari, maybe in Pontiac. And this is probably the display that people like the most. They can associate, you know, when I was a kid, we had a wagon and the family went on trips and everybody can associate with this. So it's been a very popular display, uh, but recently I've been kind of thinking I'd like to drive this car again. So I was, uh, had thoughts of updating this to the, the 70s. So if you remember the 78 Phoenix hatchback with the tent option I put on the cover a while back, I was thinking of putting that car in there and upgrading our display to the 70s. So, and then we just rotate a lot of cars in the museum. Um, we had the Pennzoil Pontiac NASCAR, now we've got the Caterpillar Grand Prix NASCAR. Um, and then on the right there you'll see the miniature uh, cars. We have a couple of those right now on display. Uh, the other one is in the Fiero display. Now this display has been up for a while as well, and I was ready to take it down when I was contacted by a Fiero group who are going to bring 250 Fieros to the museum in, in August. So I thought, uh, I better do this up at least till later. <laughs> anyway, uh, the chassis on the wall I got from a record yard in Granville, Ohio. That was an engineering chassis I found on the internet. It went to, uh, uh, it was research material basically. And then we got a whole set of the panels. Um, but a lot of people, again, associate with the Fiero, sometimes not in the most positive way, but nonetheless, they have memories and recollections of the Fieros for sure. Uh, the race car in the background was donated to the museum. Um, that was a fairly successful uh, Fiero race car. He, he won several regional championships with that road course race. And so this is what downtown is going to kind of look like a little bit when all those Fieros come. And it's going to be interesting because it's going to be a weekday. So um, where we're going to put all them during a business day downtown, that's, that's going to be interesting. But we'll make it happen. And then recently, the museum had another Fiero donated this 85 GT. Um, and it's, it's a pretty nice car. Um, we have it right now getting some clutch work done to it, and other than that, it's a good, it's a good running car, so. <laughs> and then this is what the library looks like. This is half of it, and if you turn the camera around and you look the other way, there's that same amount again the other direction. Now our library is made up of three libraries. There's my personal library, which is the, on the left, that's the back shelf, and then the POCI library are the two ends. So that end you see, and then another end. And then the museum has amassed, in the last seven years, an amazing library of donated material. Uh, some from Pontiac engineers and employees, and uh, from just regular folks like you and me who have collected stuff and they've donated it. So we have an amazing library. And then, if if you've been to the museum, you know there's no charge to get in, but we offer a behind-the-scenes tour. And if you take the behind-the-scenes tour, you get to go to places like the basement. And this is what you see in the basement. So these letters you see, and I'm holding up a picture, that come from Dumas Milner Pontiac in Little Rock, Arkansas. And my late friend, Frank Kemp, is the reason I have these letters. He called me, I was on my way to the St. Charles Convention, and he says, Tim, I'm at this swapping space of this gentleman from Arkansas, and he has some letters back home you might be interested in, you need to come see him. So when I got there, that's the first place I went. And when he started explaining them to me, this picture came up in my mind, because Dumas Milner also owned the dealership in Tulsa called Milner. And each month, he was, had so many businesses and dealerships that he produced a publication every month called the Milner Dumacrat. And each, he gave each dealer or company a couple pages every month to tell what was going on. So, of course, the one in Little Rock every month, I got a hold of copies of those. And I remembered this picture, so I made a deal with the guy on the spot. 
and then about a month later went to Arkansas and picked up the letters. They're porcelain and they're made out of you know, metal. Now the letters behind are from Route and Pontiac, and many of you may remember Bob Route, who was a longtime DOCI member, and his family owned a dealership in Virginia. And if you get on uh, the internet right now and you Google Route and Pontiac, a TV commercial comes up. And it's a very funny commercial because everybody's whispering. They go to the service department and they're whispering. They go to the parts department they're whispering. They go to the sales department and they're whispering. And when it gets to the end, it says there's no shout in that crowd. <laughs> that was their TV number. So we have a lot of interesting things that don't fit on the main floor of the museum that we display both upstairs and downstairs. And I'll show you later some more of, of upstairs. And then this is a 26 Pontiac we had on display for a while. And the city of Pontiac made this mural to commemorate the 90th anniversary of Route 66 and Pontiac Motor Division. Uh, recently, this car went back home to the owner, but it served as a model for this mural. And this was airbrushed by the artist I mentioned a minute ago, uh, Tank on Bike. It's, he's a, an amazing airbrush artist. And then, not too long ago, I took a trip to Tulsa to, and I put a little story in the smoke signals, if you remember, about East West Auto. And uh, Ken Freeman, the owner, want, he wanted to retire, so he ended up closing, or is in the process of closing the yard. And uh, so I went there with my camera, and I saved one. I did my part. I, I got one car out of there and some parts. So those will go on other cars to keep them going someday. But I think around 700 Pontiacs were in there. And so it was, uh, this one I know for a fact was saved. I think Larry Pryor posted a picture on his Facebook page of this one being hauled off on a trailer. So I'm glad that, that wagon was saved. But it was interesting to go through there. And then before I left, Ken donated this overhead cam six engine to the museum and it's my goal someday to have what I call an engine room where I display a lot of unique uh, Pontiac um, drivetrain components and of course a lot of engines and so since I got this I have then acquired a four barrel setup because that's just much cooler for display than a four barrel so um, this is going to be a future project to restore this for display we have already completed a 61 Tempest half a new four cylinder for display. Uh, we have a 32 Pontiac V8, which is a unique motor. Um, I left one head off so you can see the horizontal valves and so forth. And if you'll note, down on the bottom of the black, you see the Oakland shield on there because it was the Oakland Motor Car Company producing Pontiac. Um, this is a display in the front window of the museum. Um, we've also did a 301 Turbo that's on display, and we're about to complete a 59 tripod. So um, we are in need of a uh, bottom pulley and a generator. So if anybody has a 59 60 of those parts, we need those. Um, most of you are familiar with Hearst wheels. Um, when George Hearst introduced this wheel in 1965, he used a GTO in the advertisements, and so ever since, the Hearst wheel has been tied very closely with Pontiac, particularly GTOs. Um, so recently, when this gentleman walked in and donated a, an original Hearst can, I was very excited because several years ago, we had actually acquired a set of the wheels from another gentleman who bought them in 65. And if you're not familiar with this, this is the very unique container that the wheels came in. Uh, two wheels per container. There was a shipping label on top of the can. It's still present on this can. Um, and so these are kind of rare today, but uh, what an awesome piece that is to go with our first wheels. Um, and then each year, I try to tackle what it's not, it's a major project for the museum, but not a huge major project. 
I have to be very conscious, both financially and time-wise, what the museum can handle. And so each year we kind of, you know, identify one thing to do. And so this year, our one thing is this 1973 Grand Am four-door. And this is kind of a unique car because it used to belong to Lewis Code, who was vice president of General Motors. And the invoice on this car does not have a dealer. It has his name and home address. And as a former vice president, he, of course, got a pretty good deal on the car. And then he loaded it up. It's got, you know, of course, power steering, brakes, air, climate control, cruise, tilt, uh, 455. Um, it's got the Delco air shock where you turn the knob under the dash and it automatically airs up the shocks and vice versa. It's got an AM, FM, 8-track CD radio. Um, very nice car. It, and it had been painted already. So that's the reason I kind of thought we could handle it because that's the big money, as you know. It had already been painted. But his son is Tom Scope, who many of you might be familiar with. He worked at Pontiac for a long time, and he worked in, in engineering, he worked in product planning, he was involved in racing and prototype cars. So he was involved in a lot of interesting things. And he then got the car, and he took it to a place to be restored, and they got as far as painting it, and it got shoved in the corner and probably sat there for 25 years. And then he it then got donated, or I should say, it went to his son, Ted. And then Ted donated it to the museum. So I think we have a very good shot of finishing up the car. It's going to be a really nice car. It's going to look much like this. Uh, it's almost a twin to this press photo, except for it has a vinyl top. But it's the same color, the same wheels. Every, and, and remember those wheels, because I'm going to talk a little bit about them later. But so this is what it's, that's our project. So hopefully, if you come to the museum show in the fall, which I have to give a plug here, third weekend of September, it's our biggest fundraiser of the year. We have an all Pontiac show at the museum. And I, it's my goal to have this done by then, so you'll have to come and see if I get it done. And then another interesting thing happened. I was sitting at the museum booth at the Cruise and Tiger show in St. Charles. And a gentleman walks up to me and he says, Are you Tim Dye? And I said, Yes. <laughs> and he goes, uh, My name is, I think his last name is Zimmerman. And he said, I run a Ford dealer down in the street. I'm like, What would this guy want with me? And uh, so anyway, he said, Because I sold the dealer, we're, I'm kind of cleaning out everything. I'm, and my dad in the early 50s was a Pontiac dealer. And he said, in the attic, we have a Pontiac totem pole and a cheap Pontiac statue. He goes, do you want to come look at it? No brainer, sure, let's go. So I went right down the street, he took me up in the attic, and there was this totem pole. And these, in case you don't know, these are very, very rare pieces. They are made up of four three-foot pieces, so they're 12 feet tall. Uh, they're made out of the plaster, just like the Chief Cognac statue. Uh, they're from the same time period, made at the same place. And it wasn't that long ago that I didn't even have one myself, but because of this guy sitting right there, Old West, Lars from Sweden. It took a guy from Sweden to get me a totem pole. So, but anyway, long, long story. I'm not going to go into it, but what's, thank you, Lars. What's the vintage of the totem pole? The, he asked what the vintage of the totem pole is. It's early 50s. Yeah, it's early 50s. Yes, same time as the chief statue. So the one thing I've always been looking for, too, that I don't have is the order for that Pontiac sent to the dealer to order it. And that will answer the last questions I have about these, which is like who made them and how much they cost. 
the deal. So, but anyway, thank you, Lars, for helping me. And so here's the cheap statue that was in the, the attic of the Ford dealer. So I tried to get him to donate and thinking in my mind, okay, you just sold this dealer, you know, you're probably doing okay, but he wouldn't have none of it. Uh, he did make me a pretty good deal, so I, I bought him and we took him back to Pontiac. And I took the chief to Dias Sign Art in Pontiac, Illinois, who does a fantastic job. And uh, what they do is they fix the cracks. Usually always on the statues, the feathers are missing and the tomahawk is broken. Pretty common on every one of them. So they fix up all the cracks. If there's any chunks, they fill them. And then they uh, prime it and put a base coat on it. And then they paint them. So they look amazing when they're done. So I've had them do um, three now. Now moving them. You got to be really careful, because after all, it is just plaster. You can't really grab him by his arm, or his tomahawk, or his feather. Uh, you got to be careful how you transport him. So it's it's not a one man job. It takes several guys. So we had this situation at the museum, which is very unique, where we had three of them in one place. And I just can't imagine that happening very often if that's at anywhere else. Um, so. The museum bought the two. We sold the one that was restored, and we the museum made out very well. And the total pull is, of course, more than three. And it, I don't think it needs a total restoration. It needs some repair, but I don't think we're going to have to totally redo it. So now the museum, of course, has a statue here and a total pull. So neat stuff. So recently, you may have been seeing some post on Facebook about Tim Wangers. Um, he's in a, I don't know, what's, a, a home, I guess for better lack of a word. He seems to be doing as well as possible. I think recently it was his 92nd birthday, or he's coming up here real quick. You're right. Yes. 92nd. Yes. And uh, anyway, so they sent his office to the museum. So they packed everything up from his office and sent it to us. And um, so I just wanted you guys to know that things like this, that was made by the chapters and the places that he gave him his gifts, that I think he cherished very much and was in his office, that they are now at the museum. And that one day here, whenever I can, I am going to do a display for Jim and, and show many of these pieces um, that the clubs and stuff gave him. So I just want you guys to know it didn't go in the dumpster. We're taking care of it. Um, amongst the other things that was in his office, there was a small library of maybe 30 books. Of course, all Pontiac books. Some of them a little obscure. Most of them just the common books you and I have. But the neat thing about them was there was a sticker in the front of each one that said from the library of Jim Wanker. So that's kind of neat. There was some die-cast cars, nothing special about them. Um, and then there was a few magazines, a few papers, a few photos. There was a couple pretty good tidbits in there, but not, not like you think he could have, you know what I'm saying. Um, over the years, it's probably some of it been given away to friends and so forth. So. But anyway, I, I guess my point is I wanted to make sure you guys knew we were taking care of this stuff. Because so, he's a very, you know, beloved person in our hobby. He came for so many years to these conventions and spoke. So. And then if you read the smoke signals, which I hope you do, you saw the 13-page story that Mike Mann and myself did on this 1970 formula that the museum now owns that has 434 miles on it. It had 433 when we got it, and it's now got one more mile on it. But anyway, it's, in, in case you didn't read the story or you forgot the, the deal, it's, it's black, which is a special order paid for 70. You can't get black. It's a four speed. It, it's a positive rim with performance axle. It's no power steering, no power brakes, no radio. Uh, no wheel option, uh, so it's black, black wheels, black interior, 
Uh, it's a beautiful car, so it's kind of a follow-up. I took this to promote the museum at the Trans Am National last year, and I thought, well, while I got it there, I'll put it in the judging, and it, it got gold right there. So um, it's just an awesome car. And then one of our past projects, and again I did a story on this in the magazine, was this mobile training unit trailer. They made 13 of these. Here's a great shot of the back. And these were meant to be taken by the, the zone service manager to the more remote dealerships around the country and teach out of the back. So it, it had enough stuff in it that you could completely rebuild an engine with the tools. There was a screen, a projector, chairs, uh, diagnostic equipment. It's a very well-made two-axle trailer, and we found one in Missouri and restored it. So here we are back at Diet Sign Art. They do such an awesome job. This is Bill, and he's hand-painting the letters. But the neatest thing about this, and some of you were with me when we went to pick this up, is, you know, I only thought I knew what this was. I mean, from his description on the phone. And from pictures I'd seen in Pontiac's literature. So when we went over to pick it up and we opened the back of it up, and I got inside, the sun was shining real nice, and I looked up and it said, I could read the customer service and the Pontiac letters. They were gone off the outside, but they had etched into the fiberglass. And when the sun was shining through, I could read it. So I'm like, all right, this is for sure what I thought it was. So we restored it. It looks awesome now. And in the press photo, there was a 72 Granville four-door with a vinyl top. And darn, we didn't get one donated. It's a beautiful car. So the one question that I had was what color was the in the press photos because they're all black and white. And I was just sure that it was, I think this is called Aztec Gold, this one that we have. I was just sure that's what it was going to be. So I was on the phone one day with a guy who worked in the administration building where the press photos were taken out front. And the subject of this trailer and that car came up and he said, yeah, that sit out there for a couple weeks. And I go, the light bulb just went off in my head. This guy's going to know what color this car is. So I asked the question. And he says, blue. So <laughs> that didn't exactly work out. But that is one little tidbit of information I did not know when I wrote the story that I have since learned. But uh, this was an awesome project. Again, it was one the museum could handle, you know, time-wise and financially. And so a very unique piece. And then this is Bill Porter, who just He's an amazing guy. He still gets around, still will come and speak at different Pontiac functions. He was a designer at Pontiac. He was head of the uh, Pontiac studio at one point in the late 60s. He designed the Judge logo. He designed the formula hood you saw in that black formula. And this is him at the museum uh, with a piece that we had donated. It was a Grand Prix that never happened. It more looks like a Tornado or, a, or an Eldorado. But he was explaining to the people there in the museum all about the design of it and so forth. What a neat guy. And then this is another project we took on on another year. And this is part of the behind the scenes tour. This is upstairs in the museum. And this is a gallery of original illustrations from Pontiac designers that we have on this floor. And we have already outgrown this space. I probably have 10 or 12 more illustrations. Um, Jim Newman was a major contributor. You know, all these guys will tell you if Pontiac found out that you took one of these home, you were fired. And it's so funny to hear these guys. Well, I'm like, well, how did you end up with me? You know? And Bill Porter will tell you that on a rainy day when he had to wear his raincoat, somehow one of them got taped to the inside of it. And of course, when he's telling you this, He's about this tall, weighs about 90 pounds, and he leans over and he's whispering, you know, this whole time he's telling me this. Like they're going to take his pension away. <laughs> find out. So, but anyway, how Jim got all of his was when he left Pontiac, they sent him to South Africa to start designing mass transit buses and 
and trains and stuff. And then he retired from South Africa to Arizona, where he still lives. And they called him up and said, well, what do you want us to do with your things here? Which was, you know, I'm not sure what, it was like boxes of stuff that had his name on it or something. And they shipped it all to his house, but unbeknownst to them, all these drawings were in there. And so, what did he do with them? He stuck them under his bed. What else did he do with them? So, every time he would go to Chicago to see his daughter, he would come by the museum and donate one. And so, whenever we talk on the phone, I'm like, when are you going to come see your daughter? <laughs> anyway, so, at some point, I started sending him pictures of this gallery. And he really liked it, and he goes, well, Tim, I don't need these under my bed. He just shipped me the rest of them. And I think if you remember last year at the convention with uh, Tom Sherwood, he presented the last of them to, to me from the ones that were too big to ship. Uh, so this has turned out to be a marvelous space. Um, this is from John Perkins. Uh, this is, the, of course, the rear of the you notice when you take the tail lights and kind of squeeze them together and move them up, and you take the top of that bumper and put it down below, you got the 70 bumper. So in 67, they were pretty close, but the Endura was too expensive, too costly. They never ended up putting, putting it on the rear of the GPO. So here's a close up of some more of uh, Jim. Now, this one picture I wanted to talk to you about. I asked Jim, I said, Jim, do you have a picture of your space at the Pontiac Studio? I thought it'd be really neat. And he said, no, but I'll draw you one. So he's in his mid-80s and he draws me this picture of his space at the studio. I just thought that's priceless. I just really uh, value that drawing. That is neat piece. Now this is another project, a future project. And you may say, why does the Pontiac Museum have a boat? It's a 1957 frozen wooden boat, and it's a really neat boat, but, but this is why we have it. And again, this came from the Goad family. They've been very generous to the museum. They own property up by Mackinac Island, and this was their boat. And when Tom was working at engineering at Pontiac, he grabbed a 400 out of engineering and stuck in his boat. And it looks like this. Now the code on this says this is a 400 free speed manual, but there's no VIN number on it, so it's never been installed in a car. It's out of engineering. Your boat's in pretty good shape. It's got firebird cages in it. Um, he hand drew a whole schematic of the boat. Um, it's an amazing piece, and it really doesn't need it needs the exterior painted, it just needs lots of cleaning and TLC. It's not a bad piece, but each year I drag it out for our show, and uh, it's just a neat thing. But, and again, it's, it's got that a Pontiac background to it. Now another future project is we came across a late 30s GMC trail about trailer. Now, if you see one of these, the first thing you're gonna think, well, this is a pickup bed that somebody took and made a trailer out of. But this is not. This is a factory-built trailer. It's got a straight axle. There's a bin tag on the tongue of it. Um, when you open up the back, there's a little step that comes down where you can step in the back. And there's a, in the front, here's the actual one. You see in the front, ignore the newer piece, but you see the arm up there? There's one just like that in the back. So when this is disconnected from your car, and this was made to go on your car, you kind of want to think, oh, that would be on the back of a pickup. But that's not what it was intended for. If you had a pickup, you didn't need it. This is if you had a car and you wanted to have like a pickup. You could tow this behind your car and haul stuff. So it's a, a really neat piece. And again, it's not a huge project, but one that we look forward to tackling in the future. And then also, not long ago, I was asked to come and take a tour of this building. This is Gordon Pontiac in Joliet, Illinois. Um, it's a huge, big old building. And they were the Pontiac dealer there through 1964. And as in so many places, they 
build a new place out on the outskirts of town and move. So this is what it looks like today. In 1964, it became a transmission shop. And it's still a transmission shop, but that guy's what to retire. So I went in and they gave me a tour. And there's still parts up in the attic. But they're the parts that they didn't want in 1964 when they moved. And they're still not the most desirable parts, you know what I mean? Can you just shoot back one slide, Tim, to see the old photo of it? You want to see the old photo? Yeah, I didn't. Okay. <coughs> okay, thank you. With the shape of the windows, I almost want to think that this was like a Masonic Lodge or some kind of place like that originally. So anyway, it got really sketchy when they took me in the basement. Because think of this place being a transmission shop since 1964. When you first walk down the stairs and you got your cell phone light on, you know, you can see about, you know, that far out the front. And the floor is kind of oily, you know, and there's little transmission parts all over. You look over to the left, there's a barrel floating in something, and you want to get your hazmat suit out. You know? And then you keep walking, and there's the floor gets really soft. It's like, what am I walking on? It's really soft. And then you go a little further, and there's this mound. Like this. What is that? And the guy says, well, that's, you know, 60 years of dust. I'm sweeping the floor up above. And there's a little hole in the floor. The dust comes down and it makes a big pile. And that's what you're walking on, 60 years of dust. But there was a few parts down there that the, it, there was no deal or no method that we had there. But it was interesting to go through the building. So there is still stuff out there. So another thing I wanted to tell you about was in 1970, Pontiac started this master's sales program. And this was a takeoff of like golf, you know, the master's. And if you were a salesman and you met certain goals, you got to go each year to a, like a fancy golf resort. And they would have someone like Arnold Palmer come and talk to you, an inspirational speaker. And so you'd go back and sell more Pontiac. And uh, so there's a lot of things associated with this program, like this award. So one day I got a call from a former Pontiac dealer, and he's kind of getting up in years. And I've had several of these calls, and he goes, I got some things, you, you know, I'd like to donate. And he said, I got some few brochures, I got some, you know, bits and pieces, like they all tell me. And then he goes, well, I got this award from the master of sales. Are you familiar with that? And I said, yes. And then he said, well, if you bring a trailer, I have a friend in loading. We can load this award. And I said, well, how big is this award? And he goes, well, it's about seven or eight feet tall. And I go, what is the deal with this award? Well, this is the master's, well, I call it the mother of all Pontiac awards. But it's made out of granite. And it's got this wood piece, and then I think that's brass, the master's on top. And he said, this was on display in the administration building, when they built the new administration building in 1970. This was on display in the uh, uh, lobby. And so it was a pretty big deal. So as just recently, I got to see it in person for the first time, and I took these pictures. So when I saw this, this light bulb went off in my head. And I'm like, that matches this art screen that used to be in the administration building. Because I remember reading a story about the artist and what all this stuff. This all, it looks like that would be good to me, but it's all got some meaning, okay? And so here's the story. I went back and dug it out, and it tells about the whole thing. And it's 22 feet tall and 18 feet wide. And uh, it's not no longer there, so I'm on the trail of it. I'm not going to tell you I found it, but maybe next year I can tell you I found it. But um, here's another picture of John Sarek with that screen in the background to give you some idea of the scale of it. But then I got to looking at this picture. Doesn't that marble match the marble on the award? And that I mean, the artist must have not only done that screen. I'm, 
suspected he designed that award and all was made to match the law down from the administration level. So then it gets even better, okay? I mean, it would be awesome if I could tell you I found the screen, but I did find something else. So when I'm at this guy's house and I'm walking in the building to look at the awards, this is what was over the door. Does this look familiar to anybody? How about that? Those are the letters off the old administration building on Oakland Avenue. And I couldn't believe when I saw them, so, so uh, we kind of relieved him of those as well. <laughs> we got him. But anyway, it was a big deal to take tours of the factory, tours of the headquarters, and then it, I think it was customary for the photographer to always then have the whole group meet on these stairs and take a picture in front of this doorway with these letters. And as a matter of fact, a friend of mine, Steve Phillips, he gave me this photo. His dad, Roy, is on the far right. And Roy was the uh, parts manager at Pontiac Dealer in Tulsa. And so if you won your zone in sales, in part sales, Part of your reward was a trip to uh, Pontiac, Michigan to tour the factory and the headquarters. And so again, like I said, when they were done, they, just, they all stand on these steps and they take the picture. You might notice some changes. They added a canopy, there's a revolving door. This is all still there today, but you can read the, where the letters were. And you can see where those lights were. Remember those lights hanging there? You can see what the shadow of those letters in his life. So we've been coming across some pretty amazing history pieces. And I got these letters, and I put my truck there to give you some scale. This is off the Pontiac Motor Division billboard that was on I-75 in Pontiac, Michigan. And those are made out of plywood, and they were on top of the billboard. So we have those letters. So think about the, we're getting to be a real letters place. We got the ones I showed you in the basement, and then we got the ones above the door in here. So how many of you saw the Mysteries at the Museum episode on the Travel Channel? Thank you very much. I wrote a story about it. Uh, it was just a fun thing because I watch the History Channel when I have Kind of when I'm working on the magazine, I got the TV on in the background, and I usually have it on, you know, sometimes the History Channel. And I always kind of like this show, and they usually have a story about an artifact, and they got two scenarios. They either have an artifact as a story, or they have a story and they go look for the artifact. That was the case here. They had a story, and the artifact they were looking for was a 75 Grand Prix. So when they contacted me and said, do you have one on display? I said, sure, I got one. When are you going to be here to photograph it? And so they told me, so I hit the phone, and I got, I started, I got one lined up. I got it there like two days before they arrived. It had custom wheels on it, which I didn't think fit. So here's the story about the wheels, like I told you. I took them off that Grand Am. They were painted body color, which wasn't right anyway. And I restored the wheels. I stayed up to like six in the morning. Stuck them on there. Pulled the car to the museum like it'd been there forever. And they showed up a few hours later. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's how it works. So I thought the wheels looked awesome on there. And uh, so they came in, like they said, and it's their, They went around the museum, photographed different things. They did the judge, the buggy. They even went down in the basement, laid tracks down, and photographed some of the oil cans. But the first thing they showed on the TV was the uh, Welcome to Pontiac. So the mayor liked that a lot. <laughs> so that's where it And that's their, the way they do things is they feature the location. They then show the front of the museum building. And of course, it was the dreariest day you can imagine when they came. And then they come inside and they feature three or four things around the museum, say the museum has it. And then they give little tips like that and talk about our show. So that was, this was great exposure for the museum and the city. 
And then they get to the main thing, and they tell the story. So after they came here, then they contacted me again and said, do you know a 75 grand for you in New York? And I said, sure. <laughs> so I hit the phone again, and I found them a 75 grand for you in New York. This is, this is another shot. This is my high tech with my laptop taking a picture of the TV screen here. So. Anyway, so what the story was, there was a series of robberies in Dallas, Texas. This is in case you didn't read my story in the magazine. And they, they named the episode Cowboy Bob because that was the name they gave this person. They would come in, they would slide a note, say, I'm robbing the place, give me your money. They never spoke, never showed a gun, and then they would leave. And they were, the police were dumbfounded. They could not figure out who this person was. And finally, a mistake was made, and they didn't switch the plate on the Grand Prix, and they were able to get a home address. And they went there, and it was a woman. And she had the hat and the wig and the beard all right there in a big pile of money. And so it's kind of a neat story. But the museum was able to get some great promotion out of it. And another thing that happened recently was that Lipton Tea and Pepsi, which one of them owns the other, I'm not sure which, they're all the same. They came, they decided they wanted to introduce some new products and they wanted to do like a road traveling summer Route 66 theme to it. So somebody told them, well, you need to go to Pontiac, Illinois. So they did, they come to the museum, they come around the corner, they saw this car with Pepsi all over it, they were done. They didn't go look at another town or nothing. So because of this car, they came to Pontiac for three days, had this big event, media event, introduced their new deal. The city did a new mural with a 64 Pontiac on it, which is pretty awesome. And we also, they, you know, lift and teach colors yellow, so they saw the phoenix and they saw the yellow bird and they go, we want them. And they saw, uh, saw a couple other cars. But anyway, one of the things they asked me was, do you have a convertible that we can have people take selfies with? Because they wanted to park it in front of the big mural, if you're familiar. And have people sit in it and take a selfie with a camera that they pre-set up in there and with the mirror on the background. So I found them this 67 Grand Prix convertible from a collection up by Joliet. And we got it down there for the deal. They loved it. The car was a huge hit. And people would get in it and do the selfie. And the people taking pictures of them, taking the picture. So it worked out really, really well. And then I was needing to fill a few pages in the magazine for the July issue. And I go, well, I just got this car. It was about 11 o'clock at night. And I got this idea. Why don't we go do a night shoot with a black car? I wonder how that would work out. But well, anyway, Pontiac just finished a uh, Amtrak station. And it was very well lit. And they had those letters up here that said Pontiac. So you're going to see this car in the July issue. The photo shoot actually turned out very well, and uh, I was surprised, but it did. So at midnight, we were out photographing in this car. Um, we got this prototype wagon out also. They liked the wagon, you know, the idea of a station wagon and so forth. Of course, they didn't realize this was the one with kind you know, prototype car, so we were very careful with the display. We always had someone out there watching the car. It was a great event. Uh, and I think everybody was happy. We lived in the city, the city, everything worked out well for us. So lately we've been having some meetings. Not, not this long ago, but we've been having a lot of meetings lately. And it's been with some of these people. I don't know if you recognize me. Does anybody know Dimitri Kopp? He's a long time POC Act member. And and GM employee, and Mark Thomas is back there, he's another PMC guy. Uh, Tom Nash on the back left, he's a former Pontiac engineer. And then, uh, anyway, this is, a, this is a group from Pontiac, Michigan, who came to Illinois to see the museum, and we've been having meetings with them, and so we got started, on a, and this is kind of my big announcement. Um, we are in a 
process of opening a second location called the Pontiac Transportation Museum in Pontiac, Michigan. Now the first thing, the biggest thing I want to make clear, and when you tell people about this, is do not say we're moving because we're not. We are opening a second location, we are expanding, and that is the plan and what we're doing. Uh, this is the address, 250 West Pike Street in Pontiac, Michigan. And this, this museum is a former school. It was built in 1973. And as such, it is an open concept school. So there's no walls. It's 55,000 square feet. And we currently have 10,000. So um, anyway, it's, it's going to be an awesome thing. This is kind of what it looks like out front. This is like, again, another dreary day. Here's some pictures. This was the cafeteria. Now this school closed like 10 years ago. So nine years ago, 364 days ago, vandals went in and stole all the copper, wiring, tore out walls, ceiling. I mean, it's just amazing what, what goes on. And so, it's not nothing to write home about at the moment. Here's the gymnasium, it's a 22 foot tall ceiling. Um, so that gives us a nice headroom, some space to work with. Here's a shot from the cafeteria side. We're gonna take that stage out, so that'll be all one floor. This is the classroom, one of the classroom areas. And you can see, it's just a big open space. And there's two floors on one end. This is the backyard. Um, there's some acreage here. So that's good. We've got room to build a shop in the back. I kind of walked it off, and you can do a 60 by 80 pretty easy back there in what used to be the playground. This is kind of after they got done ripping out stuff and tearing up everything. This is what was the media center. And this is the downstairs. You can see upstairs. Again, you have some height here. So I'm kind of showing you the ugliest part, right? The before. We want to get back to the glory days when things like this happened in 1961. This beautiful float and all these cars in Pontiac, Michigan. So this museum is going to be a little different in that in Illinois, we just do Pontiac and Oakland. Because really that's all we have space for. And that's our main focus. But up here we're going to be able to do anything made in Pontiac, Michigan. That's going to be our focus. And so of course Pontiac is going to be the biggest part of that. Uh, Oakland and GMC. It's those three of course are the biggie. And then here's an early GMC. And then of course we've got the buggy companies that were there, there were several of them, the Standard Vehicle Company, the Pontiac Buggy Company, and this here's the Pontiac Buggy. And then the Rapid Truck was made there, this is what turned in to be the GMC, if you came and listened to Don Myers talk yesterday, he talked a lot about this. Um, and then the cars like the Olympia was made in Pontiac. There's three of these known to exist, and a guy I know has two of them. So when I talk about these other brands, don't think they're going to be like overrun the museum because there might be one or two examples. And if we're lucky, we might get a picture of one or get one for our display. But it's not, again, it's going to be the Pontiac car and the BMC and the Oakland that's the main thing. And then also, and this has always been confusing, and one day I need to do a big story on this, but this is the Pontiac. This is from around 1907 made in Pontiac, Michigan, by the Spring and Wagon Works. But this does have a connection history to GMC and the Rapid Truck and all that, but this at the time they made just a few of these the Pontiac cars, here's another one. There was the, notice that this has the small wheels and this one has the big wheels, that's kind of the two different ones they made. But again, we know of maybe three or four of these. Uh, Don Barlow used to own one, and he sold it overseas, um, but we do have one available for display. And of course, Oakland, like I said, is going to be one of the main 
uh, things we feature there. And of course, Pontiac. So I was looking for an excuse to show you this car because this is one of my personal cars that I picked up a while back. But as you know me, you know I kind of like eyeball different cars, but this one fills the bill in spades. This is a 74 Grand Am four door, four speed, Posi dual exhaust, tacky gauges, no radio. So that's about as goofy as it gets. The story I got was, and the second owner only owned this for months, and I bought it from him. He bought it, of course, from the original owner, who was a uh, like a hobby race car driver. And the story was that his wife got fed up with him and all his race cars and told him to go buy a family car. <laughs> this is what he got. It's got air conditioning and four doors. That family car, right? <laughs> so anyway, neat car. So this is a group of people from General Motors. These are all uh, like supervisors. And what they're doing is they're meeting with me and talking about the day that's gonna come that they come and volunteer to do cleanup work at the building. So about a week after this, 70 GM employees show up at the building. There's four groups of them. There's a landscaping group, there's a group that's tearing up carpet and throwing trash in dumpsters, which we filled up three great big ones. There was a, uh, a painting group, and then there was a cooking group, because they cooked out for everybody. So you would not believe in two days how much work I've done there. It's amazing. They cut, trim trees, mow, clean the floors, uh, that's more landscaping work. And GM paid for all the materials. This is down in that trashy library part I showed you earlier, cleaning up the trash, painting the walls. This guy was having a great time. He, I mean, think about his daily job. He's the supervisor of the engineering department at GM. And he comes out there to the school and he puts his Pontiac hat on and he's cooking for everybody and having a great time. So, now the place looks like a park in the fire. It's amazing what it looks like, the transformation. When you get that many people all organized and working on the place. So there's a picture of the 35 sitting out in front of it. So, what our plan is, is to raise money, and do it a piece at a time. So the part there to your left is like the first section we're gonna tackle. And that includes the gymnasium and the uh, cafeteria, and then there's a, a band room that's gonna be the theater. And then what we wanna do with that middle section is pop that out and make like a showroom in the front. So here's a rendering of that. Do you recognize those letters? <laughs> <laughs> so, here's the night version of it. So, this is kind of the plan, and we have been getting, I just met with a lady from Black Star Bank, and they are looking for a place to donate some money. So, I'm going to be meeting with them in the next couple of months. GM sits at the table of every meeting that we have. And when we first sat down, the first thing she said was, GM does not give money to car-related charities. She made it very clear. Well, since that time, they have donated the two. They give $5 million to the Henry Ford Museum. And they gave another couple million to another car place. So she's kind of changed her tune. So I am hopeful that at some point, when they see this is going, that they will jump on board. So what we're doing is on July 27, 2018, at the building, at 4 to 8, we're having an open house fundraising event. We're going to bring some of those cars I showed you in to show people what kind of things to expect at the museum. You can take a tour of the museum. And of course, we're, it's going to be a fundraising thing. And one of our first, we're going to have like four different giving situations and the first one that's kind of come together is the buy the foot campaign and so this is uh, 
Uh, we have this one up and running, and we're just starting with that. And so Kenny has forms up here, and anybody who, who would like to donate or have someone that you may take it home to and, and want to give that might want to donate, we're doing it at $250 a square foot. Or we have a brochure about the museum where you can just donate any amount you feel comfortable with. But with the by the foot campaign, we have a special foot long ruler and different things. Plus, there's going to be a plaque with your name on it. So that's kind of how we're getting started with that. So I got one final story I'm going to tell you, and then I'm done. This is Harry's on the Hill in Asheville, North Carolina. And about three weeks ago now, maybe a month, a salesman, of course, this is a former Pontiac dealer. It's now a GMC Buick dealer. But a salesman there made a derogatory comment in a text about a Native American. And thought he sent it to his friend, but instead sent it to that Native American. He was immediately fired. And as a result, the dealership came under fire, and the chief statue that you've seen in the picture, which is 23 feet tall, had to go. So I found out about this. I called her. Her name's Pat Grimes. She has been under fire from the media, Facebook, all the Native Americans said that if you don't take this down, we never come into your dealer. All the local history people that grew up with this chief here since the early 60s said that if you take him down, we're not coming to your dealer. <laughs> She's in a lose-lose situation. But she made the decision. It's coming down. She donated it. We're taking it. There's a guy named Joel Baker who's the giant expert. He's made a fiberglass, and he's the same company, he come from the same company that made all the Paul Bunyans and the Mufflermen and all them. And uh, this guy is like the guy. So she hired him. She's paying for it to take him down and haul him to Virginia. She's paying for half the restoration and paid the shipping to Pontiac, Michigan. Because I just found out last week that Pontiac, Illinois may be getting their own statue. So Joel is working on that. So both Pontiacs may have a big chief. But what I plan to do with this one, he's actually a brave and he has a single feather. And I'm going to have two more feathers made for him so he is like three feathers like we know Chief Pontiac to be. Um, this is the story that was in the newspaper about the chief and the whole situation. So if you Google Harry's on the Hill Pontiac, this will all come up and you can so, anyway, she is just as happy as she can be. And I think that some of the heat may come off of her when she finally announces it, that it's going to a museum and that he's being restored. Now, he's not in horrible shape, but he has been staying up there for 50 years or better. So, uh, he, he needs cleaned up and repainted and stuff. So, um, and you can get on the internet and find Joel Baker. And there's videos of him restoring these pretty interesting. So I'm leaving you with that tall tale. And if all this stuff don't make you tired, then I don't know what does. Thank you.